In this video, we're about to embark on another historical voyage accompanied by Professor Stephen Legg from the University of Nottingham Thank you for having me. Thank you and author of Roundtable Conference Geographies Constituting Colonial India in Interwar London. Stephen gives us a vent a fresh perspective, shedding light on its critical role in Indian and imperial politics. We reveal the defiant figures who dared to stand against Western stereotypes and spotlight the influential characters like Mahatma Gandhi, Ujjal Singh and Dr. Ambedkar. Want to know behind the scenes events that shaped 20th century global imperial history, the what if scenarios like the fallout had Ujjal Singh not disagreed, and how the media's portrayal of Indian delegates influenced public opinion. Stay with us as we unveil these and more answering questions you didn't even know you had, like how the conference reshaped the relationship between India and Britain, setting the stage for India's eventual independence. Join us in this journey that is as engaging as it is enlightening, peppered with amusing anecdotes that didn't make it into the book. Otherwise than that, let's get straight into it. The first question to kind of start with, and this is something we do with all our guests, which is just to kind of get a better idea of who you are and how you ended up not just researching this area, but kind of in the uh, kind of seat that you're in at the moment at the University of Nottingham. Sure. Yeah. Well, when I was doing my A-levels, I had no idea whether I wanted to do history or geography at university. I'd always had this, his, this real interest in the history of cities and I got a developing interest in India and sort of imperial connections. But as is very contemporary discussions about the curriculum at the moment, we weren't taught at school at all. We did Tudor England, we did the First World War and the League of Nations. Nothing really about the empire. We did the Ottoman Empire, but nothing about the British Empire or slavery. So that wasn't really part of the journey then. But I think I, I always thought practically that geography would lead to a career where I'd be able to apply my knowledge more. So I went for geography, went to University of Cambridge, and only when I got there did I realise there was this thing called historical geography, which is where the geographies of the past, but it's where history and geography intersect. And Cambridge was a sort of strong centre for that. So that led to me doing my undergraduate dissertation on New Delhi, how the British built this city that would govern the 20th century Indian Empire. That became a PhD. Um, I, had a, I was lucky enough to get a postdoc at Cambridge where I helped turn that into my first book. And then in 2006, I moved to Nottingham, which is also another st a place where historical geography is strong in the UK. So since then, I've been just continuing to pursue that, that interconnection. How do you approach historical questions of empire as a geographer? And sometimes that's very small, looking at what Indian homes were like in Delhi, looking at the good Rasis Ganjong Chandi Chow, which is a site I've studied at a, at a shooting in 1930. But then just try to build up a series of projects which enable you to think about different scales. So in my other work, I was looking at the idea of India as a state. How did it emerge? It has princely states, it has provinces, it has presidencies. And then in the work which led up to this, thinking about the international realm, and when India started to have a global presence as an international figure that represented itself. So not the Secretary of State for India in the cabinet, that technically was India's international representative. But in the 1920s, India started to have a global presence. So I became interested in that geography as well, the beginnings of global India. That sounds amazing. And there's so much in there that we could just end up talking about in itself from um, just even you mentioning about the geography of like the good order sea scones and even just some of the houses and all and some of the other stuff you're discussing um which i'm sure we will end up recording in the future so anyone listening who's been interested um hopefully somewhere down the line we 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 have Stephen back again to discuss this just then focusing on the 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 topic of discussion for this podcast then and for those listening kind of could you just give us a basic overview of what are the roundtable conferences? Yeah, well, what I found is if you're a scholar of Indian history, if you look at Indian textbooks, Indian history textbooks, the roundtable conference is, is simultaneously, everyone has a rough idea about it, but nobody really knows much about it. But the one thing they do know is that it failed. So the conference took place in 1930. Um, there was a deadlock in Indian politics, which we can talk, talk more about later. But whether it was Hindus or Muslims, whether it was whether India was split between hereditary states, the princely states, British India, they were on different paths. It was not clear how they'd be governed together. Hindu and Muslim deadlock, the anti-colonial, more radicals uh, in the Congress party versus the more uh, conservative. There was a real sense that India had reached a sort of deadlock. 
at every attempt to solve this by an internal conference in India, by a report, by a commission, hadn't really got there. So a relatively liberal viceroy, he was actually a Tory viceroy Urban, had this idea that to break the, the deadlock, the leaders of political and social India could be invited to London to directly talk to the British government. Now, this hadn't happened before. All of these negotiations had taken place in India. And many people felt that was the problem. So it was a radically new idea that colonial subjects at the government's expense could be shipped from India to London for weeks on end, months on end, as it turns out, to negotiate with the leaders of the empire. Prime Minister, Chancellor, Lords, Ladies, the whole of London turned out, in an attempt to find a solution of what do you do with the largest, most profitable empire, and it was an empire, the, the Indian Empire was part of the British Empire, what do you do with their demands for greater self-government? And nobody had the solution. And it was part of an ongoing problem that emerged from the First World War. So this was a world first, really. And why I suggest in the conclusion of the book is that they anticipated uh, conferences in the 50s and 60s when the other colonies exited the British Empire. Many of those exits were managed by conferences, bringing people to London or sometimes British diplomats traveling, especially to Africa, to try to find out how will this particular part of the empire lead or how will it be um, managed in a way that will guide it towards independence. So it's completely new. Most British um, government advisers couldn't believe that you were going to even attempt it. They were convinced it would fail. Many felt it did. But that's what happened. Over 100 delegates met. They hoped it would only take one session. They ended up taking three. Um, and at the end, something was produced, which did lead to the next stage of India's constitutional development in the empire. People disagree on whether it was a success or not, but the conference just about got there. In your book, you aim to redefine kind of this, just like you were discussing, you kind of aim to redefine how we understand the conference and view it. Now, could you kind of just shed some light then on how your understanding evolved throughout your research and writing process? Because I'm sure obviously at the beginning, you, you may have had a particular assumption and by the end of it, actually the evidence says something completely different. Um, and was there anything surprising that you discovered during your research that made you kind of just go, hold on, like, what is actually going on here? Yeah. Well, this is, um, it's important to acknowledge that this is part of a collaborative project. Almost exactly 10 years ago, um, I had a conversation between myself, um, a student at the time, Jake Hodder, he's now a lecturer at the University of Nottingham, and his co-supervisor, Mike Heffernan. We started thinking about a project that we could collaborate on, and we realized that we'd all been engaging in some ways with this phenomenon of internationalism, which was a movement that predated the First World War. But after the First World War, many people started to believe that it was nationalism which led to so much conflict during the war. Obviously, it was nations forming unions to, to fight with each other. And that war would only repeat itself unless people committed to internationalism. That you should put aside national divisions between territories and people and work to come together. And what we realized is that the, these new internationalist movements often coordinated their campaigns through international conferences. Now, there have been congresses before, there have been scientific conferences, but these big sort of political conferences were something quite new. And we thought as geographers, it'd be really interesting to study how these world visions got condensed down into these meetings. So, Jake looked at the Pan-African Congresses, Mike looked at the League of Nations Conferences, and I wanted to look at this to ask the question, did the Roundtable Conference function like these other big international conferences, like the Peace Treaty of Versailles or big disarmament conferences in, in Geneva? And in the end, I think I can prove that it did. Its model, its mode of operating, the secretariat that made it function, the way it ordered itself, its use of experts, was undeniably influenced by this internationalist model. However, what is also clear is that the British were using this conference not to accelerate India towards independence, but to try to keep it within the empire. Longer. So 
what can we give it that will satisfy demands for more self-government, yet not yet retain British core control? So in that sense, the international conference, which for many people was a mode of being open and liberal and democratic and progressive, was used in London to pursue very different aims, keeping an autocratic government in control in India. But I think that actually just makes it more interesting because what other people have shown is that fascists were using the international conference as a way of forging international unions. Anarchists were, communists were. It actually is a, is a form of, of organising people. Could be used to organise pretty much anything. Um, and the British found that as well. So the reason it was especially useful for the British is that they were, they were inviting delegates to London, some of whom were on the more radical side, most of whom were quite liberal, but nationalist campaigners. So the form of the conference could convince people that the British were at least willing to tolerate more progressive ideas. But the way it was organised, the mechanism, the way it was set up, and many people became quickly convinced of this, was designed to disable any really progressive um, consensus being reached. So my journey went from initially thinking this isn't an international conference at all. It's about holding to empire, as a previous book on the conference argued. But the more I went through it, I realised that internationalism, for many people, was about that. Internationalism wasn't always progressive. So we can think of this as sitting along a grand sort of spectrum of international conferences in the interwar years, and it deserves a place there. But what is also true is that if you're going to have that sort of conference form, it is it is unpredictable. You can't invite that many people with that many different interests, put them in London for two or three months at a time, and control everything. And that is, it is clear that the conference was slightly out of control, but in the end, it, it got to roughly where the organisers wanted it to go. And I'm trying to move from the chaos of what was often happening to the end result and that's what i do in the book was it kind of more so of the power structure that existed had control over what the end result was as in like i, I get your point of that actually it's nigh on impossible to control that many people especially in in any manner of debate or discussion but if there's a control if there's some type of mechanism like how, I guess what I'm actually trying to ask is how does it go from all of these people, all of these delegates that arrive and their ideas and suggestions to the final product without perhaps some of the more progressive or more radical ideas actually making it through? Yeah. So in many ways, I argue that if you look at how the conference actually operated on a day-to-day -day basis, you have there a perfect sort of simmering down of, of the broader challenge of 20th century colonial India. How do you supposedly let it be a liberal place where there are elections, tiny, tiny electorate, tiny franchise, but there are elections, there's education, there's a press. It's not free, but it's, it is a press. How do you maintain control as a colony, really, which it effectively was? You have, you have subjects, not citizens in India. How do you, con how do you deal with with that tension between democracy and autocracy, colonialism and liberalism. And what I think you see when you look at the organising of the conferences is a perfect example of how the British tried to do that. So they selected all the delegates. There was no election. No one was said, who would you like to send to India? You got a letter or a telegram saying, you've been selected to represent the Sikhs of the Punjab or the, the Christians of South India or the commerce, the commerce industry of Bengal. Would you like to accept? If so, you've got three weeks to get to Bombay and we're going to send you over to London. So first of all, you know, there, are, there are certainly no communists, there are no anarchists, there are no revolutionaries. A lot of people really object to Gandhi going because he's viewed to be a radical. If, if the civil disobedience movement is launched by him in the spring before the first session takes place. So first of all, you select people who aren't too radical. Others suggest then that what you do is you stack the delegates so that they can't agree. So you, you, you create a conference that will fail, after which the British have to come in and say, we gave you a chance to create a new constitution. We're going to have to come in and do the rest for you. And many people felt that to be the case. And then what you do is you present the delegates in a particular way. So it, it, it didn't 
happen on all the official documents. But the British clearly viewed there to be a Muslim set of delegates, a Hindu set of delegates, a liberal set of delegates who were always classed as liberal, even though many of them were Hindu, female delegates, the depressed caste delegates, Dr. Ambedkar, um, commerce delegates, whereas on the British side, you acknowledge that there are different parties, but they're all fundamentally first, the British. So in that sense, and you can look at the table plans by which they seated people, that was always the predominant assumption, that India was divided, predominantly by religion, and then by politics, and then by business. So what many people argue is if you invite people on those terms, you're setting, you're setting them up to fail, to disagree, and then you can blame them. So that's the dynamic, an open conference in which people are allowed to set their own agenda. But by the time they arrive, there's a heavily suggested agenda that ends up getting accepted. Everybody's allowed to give an opening speech, but the idea is that the speeches will be so antagonistic that there'll be no immediate consensus. So we see this again and again, that under the impression of being an open and liberal and free conference, many argued that it was rigged to only produce one result, which was that the British would have to mediate. And that's ultimately what they did. But many things did happen that were unexpected. And that is why the conference is so fun to watch in its detail. Before I, I ask you about some of those more unexpected events that occurred during during the actual um, conferences, you obviously mentioned that Gandhi is there. Who were some of the other kind of influential characters or perhaps some of the other characters from that have been invited from India that we may not be so well aware of? Because um, I, I never knew this and I, I love the fact that um, that we have these discussions for it is, is that I never actually was aware that they would send the letters to the delegates. I had some understanding of like these people were already in somehow cooperating or working or like allied with the British, I would have assumed. But if, if the fact that they're picking them at random is quite, or not at random, but they are being selected rather than elected or or kind of the communities are saying, oh, these these are our leaders, these are the people or, or however. Um, it's, it's quite interesting. So yeah, who, who are some of the other characters from India that are, are, are being invited over? So m many influential people, some are, are still familiar to me. So the, the Adha Khan, who was a lead uh, of, of Muslim, Muslims globally, not a large Muslim population in India, but the fact that he, he wasn't committed to one of the large uh, political actual electioneering Muslim parties in India, gave the impression that he could bridge different communities within Muslim India and internationally as well. So the other Khan, incredibly rich, very influential, well-known in, in the UK because he's a real fan of horse racing. So he has these horses which were in the garden. So he's, at, he's actually quite well-known. And he ends up being elected to lead the British Indian delegation. So whether you're Hindu or Muslim or Sikh, the, the princely states had a, had a the delegation and, and so did the British Indians. So the Aga Khan is very influential, perhaps not as well known today. What is interesting is that Muhammad Ali Jinnah attends, um, but is much less influential. This is before he's arisen in, in the Muslim League. So in essence, he's crowded out by some of the other Muslim delegates and has quite a bad conference. Um, after this, he, he starts practicing law in, in the UK, in London, and then returns to India later. So it's a very famous name now, but not a big player at the conference itself. Um, some of the other really big names um, are Tej Bahadur Sapru, who was a, a lawyer and a committed liberal. And these liberal politicians, I think, not I think, were written out of Indian history because for Congress, they opposed Congress methods. They, they disagreed with civil disobedience. For Indian Marxists, um, after independence, these were anti-revolutionary, anti-radicals. And they were sort of written off as just being sops of the British, just trying to be Englishmen and adopt their means and methods. I think there's a big reappraisal now because Sapru in London, was he was the, he was the chief constitutional expert. He was constantly advising everyone on how to get this conference over the line. And um, he was incredibly respected and his, his work on enabling there to be the constitutional basis for all India, all India Federation 
was central. But many of these figures got written off for being neither Congress nor nor Marxist, uh, nor Muslim, nor nor communal. They had no religious affiliation. Um, in terms of their women delegates, um, I find many ways to, to write about how women influenced the conference. But there were two female delegates, one Muslim, one Hindu, for the three sessions. And in the second session, there was an extra female delegate, um, Sarojini Naidu. But again, these women are not really remembered. Um, Begum Shah Nawaz was the daughter of, a, of, um, a, of another delegate. She was sort of the star turn of the conference. Um, film and newsreel footage was just becoming mobile to the extent that it could be taken into a palace where this conference was held. And her speech at the conclusion of the first session was a sort of global media hit. People genuinely didn't think Indian women could be educated in English, could do, could do a speech in a room to 200 men smoking cigars. So these figures were all influential, but yet Gandhi does crowd out everyone. He was only there for the middle of the three sessions, and he admitted he, he didn't succeed in the formal conference space. So part of my book has been trying to tell the story of the other people who really were working the conference nonstop for three years. Gandhi sort of arrives, disagrees with the way the conference is set up, tries to solve the Hindu-Muslim deadlock, which was the chief problem, finds he's frustrated and declares to the conference that he's failed. Um, but he's still the story of the conference. And this book tries to tell, to bring in a much broader cast of characters. Who it would be, or who were the delegates from the Sikh community and how was that split up? Was it kind of like just the Sikh community representative or was it split in terms of, I don't know, like different areas of the country or, or whatever? Because some of the distinctions you were talking about were quite interesting. Yeah. So the, the way in which you were, technically, you weren't, technically you were just listed as a member and then there was, there was a supplementary information. So the Sikh community, um, was represented mostly through Ujjal Singh. He was part of Kushan Singh's um, family. Uh, he was Kushan Singh's uncle. So he was there for the first two sessions. And um, what was easier and harder for him was that he, he, he's a Derby seat uh, representative. He just had one issue, and it was how many seats do we get in the Punjab Assembly? How many seats can we be guaranteed in, in the Central Assembly? Other, other issues were, were pivotal. But what is interesting is that because the Hindu Muslim deadlock was a, in large, it came down to seats in the Central Assembly, Punjab and Bengal. And the, the conference wanted everything to be by consensus. So one person, if they disagreed with a major um, um, proposal, could, could really bring down the whole thing. And in terms of dramatic moments, there was one, but there was a small sub-room in the St. James Palace called the Tapestry Room. There was one moment where they'd almost got a deal that Muslims had been debating about reserved or or um, whether they'd be guaranteed seats who would represent them. And they'd almost got this over. But I think there was a, there was a few percentage points that Ujjal Singh uh, objected to. And he blocked the whole thing. And there's a letter which someone wrote of individuals going in, women begging him, sat through chastising the prime minister, the head of the British Empire, coming into this room beseeching him. And he absolutely refuses to budge and it collapses. So that's what I was saying. The third session was a really watered down session. It only lasted a month and it's basically just sign it off. Um, but Tara Singh is there, but he's not He's not really a major figure in that sense, but he's he's there. And I think, I think he sees a, a lot of how the empire is functioning and the, the direction of travel um, of how these central negotiations were taking place. So it may well be, I'm, sure, I'm certain it is, that his experience in in London goes to have a big influence on, on radicalising him, really, seeing that this was the only way to defend, as he saw it, the, the um, capacity for self-representation for Sikhs in the Punjab. Um, and what you see from this period on, I really think, is a, is a hardening, because that there wasn't consensus reached by this method. The best chance there would ever be for consensus. So I think people go back to India and think we're just going to have to 
embed it, yeah. whether that's a community level. Someone else I talk about a lot in the book is uh, Dr. Munja, who's a big figure in the Indian Maasai, but he comes back and he is committed to uh, military training of, of youth. He's he's not part of the RSS. He tries to establish an alternative, but that's what he sees as the future of defending your your community. So this is that period when people do start to think actively about community defence. And it, it may well be because they saw that this consensual model of conferency didn't work. And there, there wasn't going to be another conference like this. This had the biggest budget, the biggest delegates, and it didn't work. Just going back to Ujjal Singh in the second session and him essentially objecting to, to those a few points. Um, I'm not really one to get into what if history, but if he had not objected to that what would have been the likely outcomes or like what would have been different per se i know that's a huge question and there's so much to it but like in your estimation yeah well it literally if things had panned out a different way here without too much crazy thinking it's entirely possible that there wouldn't have been the partition of india and pakistan because if you if the all india federation model had been passed if enough princes had agreed before 1931, it would have triggered an all India federation. And within that system, it's entirely possible that you could have had blocks of Muslim states who were formally or informally campaigning together within a federation that would have allowed them a, a degree of autonomy within that that state um, that was not was not possible otherwise. Now. The, the way Congress reacted when it was elected in 1937 in the provincial ministries suggests that they wouldn't have been comfortable with that centre anyway. But that is one way you could have gone. Um, in terms of in terms of the Punjabics, it's entirely possible that the the, the reserved seats and the reserved areas for um, seat votes could have completely changed the way in which the Sikh community started to think about whether or not it needed or wanted a state. Um, but there could have been a system, maybe specific to the Punjab, in which um, those seats would have been allocated in a way that was felt to be representative. I also talk about a scheme proposed at the second session, which Gandhi was willing to have discussed, which would have redrawn the boundaries of the Punjab to alter the population weightage, such that there'd be no need for this discussion about seats, so that you'd have majorities, minorities balanced through the nature of the population. This was felt to be uh, a, an attempt to part, and the language at this time in 1931, this is an attempt to partition the Punjab, and that would never happen. Now, what they were referencing there was the 1905 partitioning of Bengal. They weren't anticipating partitioning of the of the broad state. Um, but yet so much, so so many directions come out of this, this moment. Um, but what I would also say, um, and again, something I haven't anticipated at all in the book, was the sort of constraining impact of the telegram, which which was had on the conference. So the idea, the idea was to take people out of the sort of febrile, hostile environment of India, take them to London and have lots of cucumber sandwiches and tea parties, and let's talk about this and calm down atmosphere. But because of the telegram, stories could be telegrammed to India overnight they could hit the evening post or they could hit the morning post someone could wake up and i, I don't like these sort of analogies to the contemporary but we like we, we like to think of global media as being quite recent 90 years ago within 24 hours you could have heard what happened in london had it printed had a meeting fired up a telegram and people in london were being told what to do by someone you know some provincial organization in in hyderabad and this is what people say repeatedly. But like, I can't, I can't give you any more because I've just been instructed by eighteen different sabas that I've gone too far. And what you find repeatedly is that everyone is more willing to budge in London in the room to realise this is a world historical moment. Let's compromise a bit, and then they just get waves of telegrams. And the British organisers despair at these telegrams when they actually do seem to roll progress. There's nothing we can do. So, um, the Muslim um, 
block before the conference has even started after this intense negotiation has said that it's willing to give up separate electorates, go with joint electorates in key constituencies, word get back to India, and they'd force to drop it. So it's nice to think that the conference could have done more, but the reality of it is that these delegates were being told repeatedly that they're only there representing their constituencies. And because of the telegram, in almost real time, they're being told, don't back down, don't betray us. That's amazing. Um, just, uh, oh, sorry. One question was, how is Ujjal Singh received then? So once he goes back to Punjab or once he goes back to wherever he lives, how is he received by the rest of the community and even just the wider population in terms of just the rest of India and even the British? Because I have to admit, I've never, uh, I have to admit my research in this area is quite scant and, and I wouldn't say I'm an expert by any means, but I haven't really heard of him much. Um, you saying that he's the uncle of Kushwan Singh, I've heard of Kushwan Singh more so than I've heard of Ujjal Singh, right? Um, but how is he perceived and kind of what happens to his, him and his legacy? Well, that, that in itself is a perfect example of why people felt that being selected rather than elected as the delegate was pointless because you had these old loyal parents. His brother had constructed New Delhi. Um, he was... He, you can't, you don't get closer to that government than being the brother of the person who built the government buildings. So you, you, you have been, and I know this more from my work in, in Delhi, you have the sort of right by our doors and then you have the, the side of things. And these are basically viewed by people just to be lawyers. But when you see how they operate in, in, in London, they're absolutely not. They, they are very much members of their communities. They, when, when you have, Tara Singh and you have which I think the, the comparison in terms of how they operated in London, how they how they felt about the administration of good wars in 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 in, in the UK uh, in India, how they felt about representing their their community, they're completely completely different. So I think that's what just Singh was. He wasn't a lawyerist. He was he was a really rigorous campaigner, but he he was part of that older generation, and that is who the British were comfortable dealing with. And that's why so many of them got invited to London. But interestingly, a lot of um, these delegates, some of them wrote memoirs. I didn't find just things. He, he did some interviews, which is saved in um, in Team Roti in London. They really felt they were strung out to dry when they got back to India because everyone viewed, and again, we could talk about this later, everyone viewed the conference to have failed. That was how it was depicted. Many communities came out quite well. But especially the liberals, they felt forever that they put themselves on the line because the conference took place in the middle of civil disobedience movement, a global moment that propels Gandhi to sort of sainthood and um, and and um, planetary celebrity. And this is a romantic movement. The youth loved the movement; they wanted to go further. These are the people who are denying it. First in the second, first in the third session, Congress is imprisoned, its officers have been confiscated. They positioned themselves, they took a punt that this could lead to a a progressive outcome. And it isn't for many of them, they, they don't really recover. It's a taint to have been part of this conference. In an India that is, I don't want to suggest that everyone was part of these mass luscious meatballs. Yet a, a lot of them were so no you, you don't necessarily hear about these these figures just then talking about the delegates themselves like obviously hundreds of people are being shipped over into england in 1930 um they essentially like without being too crude or crass about it, it's a bunch of brown faces turning up all of a sudden in the middle of, of the epicenter of, of the white british empire like how are how are they received, not just by the people that they're talking with, but even just the locals? And what is the kind of reaction? Yeah, exactly. Um, well, it's that sense of reaction which I think surprised me most in two senses. And I think it was more extreme on, on both sides. Um, first of all, the, the Congress party um, had a branch in London. And they estimated, I'm not sure where this data came from, but in 1932, there were about 7,100 Indians. And when I say Indians here, I'm talking about India at the time. So, uh, what is that, Bangladesh, in India? 
about 7,000 Indians living in London. And I think in my head, I had a view that they would either be barristers or they'd just be satanists and mascots and they'd be based out with dots in the extent. The moment really when that overturned in my head was when there was, I watched some news footage of the conference and I've got a website that goes along with this project in which I list, you can access all of this news footage. And there's a brilliant one when Gandhi arrives and he goes straight from, it's tipping it down with rain and he gets driven to St. Pancras and he goes into the Quaker's friend's house on Euston Road. And the camera pans around as he comes in. And the first time you watch it, you're just looking at Gandhi. And then you watch it again and you scan across the crowd. And there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Indians, you know, in trench coats and umbrellas getting soaked. And what's really surprising is they just look like middle class standard workers. They'd taken a day off work to come and look at Gandhi. And, and then when he goes to the East End and you, you look again, sometimes the cameras catch it. There's just dozens, hundreds of these uh, Indians in London who, who turned out. So first of all, there's a sort of diaspora, not a huge one, but there is a diaspora functioning in London. There's a Gandhi Society in London. They organise dinners for him and present money to take back um, to him. Um, so that was that was something I'd not really considered before. And there's some really great writing on the Indian diaspora in London. The second thing which really took me back is I read a lot of newspapers during the coverage, from the broadsheets, Times, the Telegraph, due to the sort of tabloids like the 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 Daily Express, the Daily Mail, things like the, the sketch, but also a lot of photojournalism papers like the, the graphic. And what amazed, amazed me across all the, the full range of the newspapers was the depth of engagement with Indian questions in all types of press. Now, fair enough that the tab on the sort of photojournalism side, it, it might be more about how rich the Maharajas were, how many wives they had, and that sort of stuff. But even in those, when there was a big debate happening in the conference over rep representations in the Punjab or what would happen to the Christian community in Goa, they'd cover it in the newspapers. Whereas with the broadsheets, page after page after page, month after month, of recounting all of these debates. And, and that was just what struck me. The number of people in London who either through generations long family connections with India having worked there themselves, hoping to work there in the future, um, there was just this really dense engagement with Indian questions, which again, when we referencing back to those debates about the absence of empire in um, our education system, but also perhaps that we don't really think enough about the outside world other than the space of crises and developments. Back then, India was, Britain was intensely aware that it was the centre of the British Empire, but also as a hub for all forms of global capital, migration, movement. And that's, obviously there were racists and xenophobes at the time as well, but in general, it seemed to be, in the media, a remarkably open place. And very knowledgeable people knew about the different regions of India. You didn't have to explain what the sin was or that there were two Hyderabads. It was just no. So that builds up one picture that's dangerous, not dangerously, it's temptingly cosmopolitan. Little was a great place to be. They've been set around by hundreds of years. But what also became apparent, and I think people were willing to commit it to paper much, because on the British side, they were, on both sides really, I think there was some embarrassment about it, was that it's clear that if you were a certain type of, <coughs> of Indian, you could do well in London. The Bar of Joe had a, and it always had a same suite, the um, Aglis Savoy. Um, the Aga Khan, just kept a room at the Ritz, you know, these incredibly rich and bunch of people. What was also anticipated, however, is that many of the delegates weren't wealthy, and the organisers were worried that they would basically be mistaken for an ordinary Indian on the street and face what they faced. And that was just everyday, open, hostile racism. And there's one delegate who's fascinating um, because um, he had a supporter who wrote a biography of them detailing what he, what, what he faced in London. He was an Indian Christian delegate, a close friend of Gandhi, Dr. S.K. Datta. And his wife, um, he met on the internationalist sort of, um, Christian association circuit. She was Scottish. And what she said is that she, she tried to shield him from knowing about it, but she would have to approach dozens of hotels to accept, uh, especially, I think, to accept them as a mixed race couple. 
we find letters being sent to the government when they're planning the conference saying, listen, we think you need to put on a, provide a social club where Indians can go and get accommodation and host and invite people for dinner because many restaurants won't accept it. And we're worried about what effect that's going to have on the conference. And others saying, we don't know if they're safe walking the streets at night because we know what happens to Indians in the city. So that media image, the press image, very quickly breaks down. And what you realise is that they had real concerns. I don't think they thought they were going to be mugged. It's the atmosphere was so vital. And it's the risk, it's the risk to all of the, to their mental well-being would be a very gentle funny. But also you didn't want controversy, you didn't want a scandal. So for the first session, they created um, the Indian Social Centre at Chesterfield Gardens in Mayfair. You could stay there. There was um, chefs brought in from various armies on Regent Street to give them half decent Indian food. And you can invite guests. But you couldn't, even, it was noted, in the gentlemen's clubs that were designed for people who had served in India, they didn't like it if you took an Indian guest. So that was the city that, that was the real city. And, and another really interesting um, cache of evidence comes from um, a, a book written by Muriel Lester, who hosted Gandhi in the East End uh, in Bow. And she, she, she was a self-publicist. She was trying to get more money for her, her mission. So she wrote a book called Entertaining Gandhi, which is her experience of hosting him in London. And she gives excerpts from some of the letters she received from people from all over the country just saying, how dare you have this, and this is a quote, I do use the quote in the book, because I don't think we shield this language, how dare you have a naked nigger in your house? That sort of level of, of attack. So I think people were reluctant to commit it to the archive which I work with, but there's enough that gets through to suggest that that is really prevalent. In the city, and the government's response was always the same. And this was reported in that there were Indian journals published in London for Indians in the UK, United India. Said so the government's response was always that was a private matter. So nothing, nothing, not, not we can't make hotels take Indians. That was the lot. Well, I think what's interesting for me is, is that a lot of those stories aren't actually that dissimilar to some of the experiences that my food parents grew up with or my grandparents grew up with um and yeah it's just interesting how some of those attitudes have stayed and changed over time but anyway just just kind of changing the perspective slightly well how then did some of these indian delegates challenge western stereotypes because i think a lot of i know there's a particular kind of section of the british community or well versed with india who have either been out there for military service or some other kind of civil service and have a better understanding than most, but I'm sure there's also a whole section of the population that have no idea. Like the person sending that letter to the to the lady who hosted Gandhi, I'm sure she probably would have been blown away when the Maharaj of Patiala has like 15 Rolls Royces or whatever or whatever it is, right? Um. So how do some of these characters that are being shipped in from India challenge some of those stereotypes in England at the time or in the empire at the time? Yeah, I think what was most interesting about what this conference introduced to the British public, were well, those Indians who were neither Gandhi, in loin class as they called it, I think it was a loin class, or the rich princes. I think those were sort of acknowledged, they were famous famous. The Maharaja of Pekinir was King George V's aide de camp on his Prince of Wales. He, he'd been at the coronation, they were close friends. The Aga Khan is known for his money. And his Gandhi. In between, however, are these vast ranks of people who were probably recognisable to the sort of figures which people knew in their own communities. Local politicians, charitable organisers, the equivalent of church leaders, who were not particularly wealthy, but they were educated, perfect English. They would regularly give after-dinner speeches, they'd be invited to give public lectures, they'd be invited all over the country, actually, to attend events. Birmingham, especially, the, the Indian Students' Union at the University of Newcastle invited the Maharaja of Bikini to come and give a talk, and he just politely said, no. Um, but it's, I think it's that bit in between that made people realise that it, this isn't a land of hereditary rulers governing over a semi-feudal society of 
peasants or factory laborers. There's a middle class in India, and it's well educated, it's politically articulate, very intelligent, and it can come to London and work the scene. So, in that sense, I think they overturn expectations. I've written elsewhere about there were these deep seated concerns about inviting Indians to London in the winter because they thought literally the cold would kill them, not realizing that India is many parts incredibly cold. But many of these people have traveled, they know how to wear coats. But on St. James's Palace, which was the venue, was apparently the hardest building in, in London to heat. It was a Tudor building. So they kept fires running through the night for weeks in advance to get the temperature up. And when the delegates arrived, they'd come in with all their warmest clothing. They would desperately try to get outside for some fresh air. So in that sense, they, they overturned all those expectations. They were hardworking, they were diligent, they were educated, they were willing to compromise, and they were great after-dinner speakers. The way in which, however, they didn't um, overturn expectations goes back to the sense of the conference being rigged. So when Gandhi arrives, within a week of attending these sessions, he pretty much checks out the conference because he sees precisely that no one's been represented, no one's represented, no one's been invited. So he says, he says the conference had an unreal atmosphere. There was no expectation that it could work. And because you could say maybe it was rigged, maybe just the problems were too intractable. The way in which the, the delegates didn't overturn expectations was that there wasn't consensus on many of the key issues. Now, the British suggested the key issue was the communal question. And if, unless that could be settled, nothing else could progress. Gandhi said, listen, just give us independence and we can sort out the communal question. But somewhere in between that were these staged committees. In the second session, there were only two committees working, the Federal Structure Committee and the Minorities Committee. The Minorities Committee, Gandhi argued, couldn't reach an agreement because of who was selected. And that's what was often also carried in the press. Conference on verge of precipice as Hindus and Muslims unable to agree on scheme for constitutional advance. That line basically is run again and again and again. Or more offensively in in the Beaver Press or the Rothermere Press, the, the, the Daily Mail, basically, if there's one article I quote where they basically claim that without us, India will descend into the law of the jungle. So open, openly racist interpretations of people who others would argue can't agree because it's impossible to agree on a conference organised as it is. So in many ways, I do think it, can, it really did change the view. But also... Gandhi himself fitted into that lineage of the exotic curiosity. Muriel Lester was driven mad by people asking her how many goats he was bringing to live with him in Kingsley Hall because he drank goat's milk. Now, he did drink goat's milk, but you could get goat's milk from plenty of places in London. There was a rumour that a Malavia had brought a vast urn of holy water from the Ganges because he wouldn't wash his, wash his hands in water that wasn't the Ganges. And they just said, this is ridiculous. Um, um, deflection from the, the core issues which these people were trying to raise. And when you look at what they were doing day in, day out, it was deadly dull, detailed constitutional work. All this sensationalist stuff was was a smokescreen, really. They were actually just working day in, day out to try to get progress on a conference that many argued we designed not to enable our task. Just kind of then looking at the uh, conference as a whole, what would you say then is perhaps the most underappreciated or overlooked aspect of the whole conference, like all three conferences, I guess? And how does the how do these conversations and these conferences ultimately help shape then the relationship between India and the British Empire for kind of the next however long? Yeah, well, I think mean, there's two things which strike me as the most underappreciated. The one is, is the, the thing I was hoping to find. And, and it's so prevalent, it's, it, it's not even interesting. We, we thought that conferencing would actually take place in cafes and dinners and hotel rooms and breakfasts and weekend escapes. And, and we were hoping to find that. The, the evidence of that was so overwhelming that it's now just the whole basis of the book. Every, every single space conceivable, it seems, in London was at some point visited by some delegate at which point a journalist might overhear them. So 
I thought that was going to be our chief finding. It's so prevalent that it's actually just now, I think, a, a more broadly accepted feature of how confidence is happening. So that's everywhere in the book. In terms of what's most underappreciated about this conference, it goes back to what I was saying earlier, but I suppose the underappreciated thing was how much it achieved. The, the weird thing is, is this consensus that it failed. And when I was trying to finish the book to work, work, work towards conclusion, I was trying to think about this. How do you deal with this trick that it, it is viewed to have failed? That's how it's often positioned. So what I didn't try to do was to prove the opposite, to prove that it succeeded. But you, you can't deny the fact that after these three years, the proposals of the conference went through a joint committee of the House of Westminster. It was then debated in the House of Commons. It became, up until that point, the longest act ever passed by Parliament. The Government of India Act 1935 creates, creates immediate provincial autonomy and lays down the conditions, if the princes agree to join, that you trigger an All India Federation, a union of those two parts of India. So the question is, how do you square the fact that it laid the root to that, yet everyone says it failed? The two things are seemingly incompatible. And I think I've realised that they're not actually incompatible. And what I argue in the book is that I use this metaphor that the conference is almost like a ritual sacrifice. Everyone had to sort of kill it and, and claim it failed so that everyone could put down those issues that they got stuck on, that they've been fighting over for years, and just quietly move on to something new. But the new thing is actually quite similar to all of that stuff that had gone before. The deadlock was so intense. If you can't have a solution, let everyone agree it failed, and then just sort of, not start again, but move on. So for example, if the, the British party is quite complicated, the person who called the conference was the Labour government, the second Labour government. This is at the time the Wall Street crash. The, the Depression is just starting. There's a political crisis. So the national government is formed. Um, they win a huge majority in a, in a separate election. So you effectively have a Labour prime minister governing a national government that's mostly Tory ministers. It's a very, it's the sort of coalition from hell. They're, they're leading it. And the core of the Conservative Party is not the right wing. Again, this might seem familiar. But the part of the Conservative Party that gets all the press is what we called at the time the diehard. The, the right wing is led by Churchill. And they were dead set against any constitutional progress. They just wanted to keep in the um, quotes. So what then happened is the government had to get this bill through Parliament in the face of these Tories who were dead set against anything. So what you can claim is the conference failed. It was a failure for those who wanted mass constitutional progress. It was a failure for those who wanted immediate federation. It was a failure on all these counts. So we managed to give you the weakest version of this. So help us get it through. Oh. Hindus and Muslims who had wanted to be more progressive in, 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 in London were constantly being battered back. There wasn't an agreement. The, con the conference failed to reach an agreement. And Ramsay MacDonald issued the Common Award in 1932. He said, listen, you haven't been able to agree this. But looking at what you've got to, I'm going to say, this is how the seats are going to be distributed. This, this is. That becomes controversial, not because of the distribution of Hindu Muslim Sikh seats. It's because they agreed to Ambedkar and others' as suggestion that the depressed classes, untouchables, as they were previously known, get their own guaranteed seats. Gandhi objects, arguing this is you splitting Hindus from Hindus, and he goes on a fast to the death, resulting in the Pune pact. Now that's a fascinating story, but what it does is distract from the fact that previously they said there was no way you could distribute Muslim, Hindu, and Sikh seats that wouldn't lead to riots. Nothing happens. Nothing happens. Through everyone agreeing it's valuable, it actually goes through. Now that they're, 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 they're dis disputed in the future. That's just two examples of how everyone agreeing it failed enabled it to sort of, not succeed, but to move. And given the old line movement before, that's a, that's a huge success. So be because everyone had to publicly say it was a failure, people haven't really looked at the conference and the detail it deserved and, it, and its legacies. And when you do, it's a very peculiar form of failure. 
because almost everything that happens constitutionally after it is informed by the conference's um, conclusions. And the great part about doing this as part of a collaboration with my colleagues at Nottingham is that when we were talking about this idea, the question is not how did this international conference fail? It's, it, can anybody think of an international conference in history? Everyone agrees succeeded. They almost always fail. There's too many, too many conflicting interests. There's too many demands. Versailles led to the Second World War. Disarmament conferences didn't disarm anyone. Drugs conferences, everyone's still taking drugs. Um, obscene publications, everyone's still reading obscene publications. The tasks are so bad. The question is, can you just incrementally move people on? When you look at the climate change conferences now, no one's stopped, shut down all the coal-based power plants, but you, you might slowly start to influence. So I think in that sense, what's what happened at the Royal Table Conference isn't that unusual. It's that these vastly ambitious, huge, long conferences hardly ever meet their main objective. The question is, can you just nudge things so that's how I tried to square this problem of successful or failure. No, no, no. Thank you. I'll solve slightly less serious questions, but still very, very relevant to the discussion. If you could have dinner with any one particular delegate from the Roundtable Conference, who would it be and why? And what would be the first question you'd ask them? So, you ch I, I try to be objective when thinking of my historical subjects, but you do develop faith. There's absolutely no doubt. There are people you know you sort of really disagree with if you met. But the one person I'd love to have dinner with is, is Sir Roger e. Naidu. So the, the third female delegate, she only attended in, in for the second session. She she was a committed female campaigner, but also she'd been president of the Congress. She really was there to support Gandhi as well. And what comes through, I haven't been able to find her private archives, but lots of her letters were published to her children from her time there. And I think she's a perfect example of someone who uses wit and sarcasm and satire to give you some real insights into what's happening at, at the con. And in that sense, I just think I'd have loved to have asked her how she has influenced what was happening at the conference. Because I do, I do write her about her a little in the book. What's interesting about her is that she, she gained fame as a, as a poet. She was an early supporter of Muhammad Ali Jinnah. Um, she was constantly trying to organize conversations and cordiales between the Indian National Congress and the Muslim League. She, she was a serious politician. She, she was president of Congress. She, she attended international conferences. But what was also really interesting I found in the footage about her is that she actually had what was referred to as a salon in Bombay, in the Taj Hotel. She kept this huge suite, and she just encouraged people to come and just chat. Let's just talk it through. You don't have to issue an agenda, we won't have a memorandum, and we even coming out of it. Just chat, bring people together, create debates, allow people to say things that they weren't held, held account to, and see if we can get people thinking in a new way. And that really is precisely what the conference itself wanted to be, it became very formu formulate. So she came to, to London and what makes you, what is so refreshing about her is that she brings a sort of humanity to the way in which she talks about people who have often dealt with this sort of sacred objects. So she, she refers to Gandhi as Mickey Mouse because of his big pointy out ears and she, she's constantly just laying into all these acolytes, these pranks and saint worshippers who she, she, she in her eyes, are very moral, but completely unable to organise a conference meeting. So she basically forces Gandhi to take an office in London. And she's quite, you get the sense she likes the better things in life. So they came over on the boat together and Gandhi made a big show of sleeping in a third class cabin and sitting on deck. And she was like, no. <laughs> she took a first class cabin and just dined, dined upstairs. So she gets him a place in Knightsbridge, it's probably the most expensive real estate in London now. It got bombed during the war, but it's just near Parrots. And she basically sets up this HQ in which she hires people to manage all his hangers on and just sh shoves them out the door and gets a bouncer and has a schedule. 
And she's con but, but it, it's not that she doesn't agree with the conference method or Gabby's objectives. She's like, right, we, we need a, a talking space to get people in. Um so yeah, her letters to her children, I recommend people to read them. She's just hilarious, but she also sees through the general whoopee, as she calls it, the dinners and the drinks, the fanfare. And she says, listen, this is fine. It, it's boring. I don't think we're going to get anything. <laughs> the most famous experience of the conference. Three, nearly three months of these sessions lasted. Lots of dinner, lots of whoopee. What's what's actually going to happen? And I, I just, would just love... But there is more to be said about her, and I think some of it's been written, but she's the one who I would love to to sat down for. Thank you for that. All right, well, then the last question I have is, were there any particularly interesting or entertaining stories that you came across during your research that didn't make it into your book? I'm sure there are many, but I, in trying to write this book, there's obviously a lot of weighty political stuff going on here. And the way I try to balance that is to put in all of the good stuff in. So there, there are so many anecdotes and bitchy little comments in letters between people and backstabbing and sniping. And it's filled with those characters. I suppose the, the one thing... I don't know if it's entertaining or just really interesting is that there's one British, very, very significant, important British delegate whose diaries I've found. Now, they've been deposited in a, a library. Presumably they were read by the family before they were deposited. So, in a sense, it's morally fine to deal with those material. But, and I didn't write about this in the book, What it appears to me that this person is, is suffering from depression depression at the very least depression probably i think something more than that he opens his diary every year by mourning the loss of his mother saying how much he misses her how he's desperate to reunite with her in heaven he's a well i don't know he's either very 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 ill or a hypochondriac there's a doctor called every three days um very sensitive to the weather when it's gray and gloomy he wakes up and he doesn't know how he's going to get through the day and I've just been interested in thinking about how, and he, and he says constantly, the stress of this, the stress of these long days, and the dinners at night, and the calls in the press. He thinks he's, he sounds like he's going to have a breakdown. But, but ironically, when he's covered in the press, he is the stable figure. He's the one keeping it all together. So I'm fascinated by these two lives, which again is not all common. Someone in the stressful job has to hold their stuff together and in behind the scenes that might be falling apart but the reason i felt uncomfortable talking about this in the book is there's a broader debate on um can you retrospectively diagnose people's mental conditions is it ethical to do so because they don't have a chance to talk back and just broadly people don't record those things in historical material so it's it's probably also just inaccurate but i am trying to think of a way of writing something that isn't exploitative of this man, that doesn't lock him as a hypochondriac, which doesn't um, criticise his two faces, that takes seriously the fact that he might just have never gotten over the death of his mother. But to use that as a way to encourage us to think about international diplomats more broadly as just doing phenomenally difficult jobs that take their toll on their physical and mental well-being. Same with Ronald McDonald as well. He died shortly after he left office and he said the strain of this stuff was unbearable at one point there was a crisis the delegate went into his westminster office and he was laying on bed unable to raise his head but still thrashing out points on constitutional reform so i think um there was a long mental toll on many of these delegates delegates who had given their life over three years in london and got back to be written off as lackeys of the british empire People who were so exhausted they couldn't pursue their career and their parties in in the UK for having committed to this, whether it was progressive or non-progressive. Many of these people were completely committed. So I think um, finding a way to talk about these individuals, not as caricatures, but as rounded people with bodies that responded badly often to the demands made at them. And to think about our ethical commitments to historical subjects. So, um, I, I, I don't feel obliged to tell the story of this man, but he's not written about much, and he's clearly a fascinating figure. But the key thing is you only get to write about these people if they're diarists. 
At the end of his exhausting day, once the chief paint had gone away, he still picked up a pen and wrote a page each day. And it's very rich. So that didn't make it in, because I don't, felt it deserved its own treatment. But I will be trying to find a way to, to write about him. If you can. But, uh, having heard all this, people might be wondering why I'm a geographer. <laughs> I'm writing about this as a geographer. And the way I structure the book is that I, I, the middle two sections are about London and how significant it was that this is taking place in London, what the local geography was. And whether it was St. James's Palace, it's, it's, it's placement next to Buckingham Palace and close to Parliament, whether it was this density of some of the world's best hotels and restaurants, institutions, learned societies, the emerging Indian dining scene in Soho, all of these things, I argue, were absolutely vital to having this conference be possible and shaping it to work out the way it the way it did. And it was those facilities. We think of conference cities now as being sort of dull corporate places, but this is a, an early example of how an imperial city, all the things that made London a good national and imperial capital, also made it the per perfect conference venue. So the city is everywhere. And what I show is these big, more larger scale geographies, dominion, diarchy, a nation state, province, all these geographical scopes get microscoped into the city, debated, and then they go and they go home. So there is a lot of geography in the book. And often it's sitting in the structure of the material. But um, just in case you were wondering, it is a geographical <laughs> No, thank you. I do appreciate that a lot. And obviously I thank you a lot and appreciate the fact that you've taken this time out. We've been talking for just over an hour and I've learned a hell of a lot. I'm sure people listening have learned a lot as well. So I can only just say thank you for that. I'm really grateful for having me. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you. And that's a wrap for today's podcast episode, folks. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did putting it together. As usual, a massive shout out to our YouTube members. Final in German Bauer, Wushu Man, A Little History of the Seats, Jagadaj, Sanjeev, Vishal Kolada, Raj Shadan, Not David, Amanweel Mandir, Hunter Hill, Radha Ji Kaur, Gauri Dunja, Gary Bramar, N Singh GS, and Jazz Dylan. And as always, let's not forget our amazing Patreon members, including Hernan Pazano, Jazz Dylan, Gurpreet Singh, Gurdi, Bath, Anish Mar, Ramnik Kaur, Rav Singh, Yasmin Jaswell, Ramnik Kaur, Gurdan Singh, Gurpreet Dunja, and Rajvinder Kaur. If you're passionate about the work I'm doing and want to support it, consider becoming a patron or a paid YouTube member today. You can find the links in the description below. Thanks again for tuning in and I can't wait to see you all in the next one.